Uh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've got um, just a few hours for you linked to communicating ideas publicly in an effective way. Uh, just two words on who I am. Um, my name is Tim. Please call me Tim. Uh, don't call me Mr. Baxter or anything like that. Uh, I'm a confused Englishman uh, because uh, my passport says UK. Uh, but um, I was born in Thailand, and I lived in Burma, Cyprus, Poland, Turkey, and since 1990, uh, I lived here in, uh, in Italy, so five years in Bari, and then I came to the northeast, and Trieste is completely different from Bari. So I'm a happily confused Englishman. Yeah. Um, what do I do? Well, I spend a lot of time at uh, uh, the hill, just a few hills away from here, which is uh, MIB School of Management. Uh, and when I'm not working there in the leadership development area, I do corporate training. So what we're going to do today, I've also done various parts of with various big corporations, uh, Electrolux, uh, what else do we have here, uh, Telecom Italia, uh, and various others. Okay? Um, we won't be able to cover everything to do with public presentations in just three hours. And if you behave correctly, we're going to have a break in the middle as well. So less than three hours, OK. Uh, but I'll try and touch some important pieces. And uh, if it's been useful, then maybe we can come back for the second part sometime in the future. OK, so that's the idea. Uh, I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible, because otherwise it's boring if it's just one way. So I'll bring some concepts, but the more ideas you've got, the more points of view you've got, the better it is. Good morning. So that's the basic idea, guys. Okay? I'll bring the process, I'll bring the content, but I'd like you to give me your points of view as well. Nothing that you see up on the screen here is sacred. All the rules are there for a reason. However, the best presenters break rules very often because they know what the rules are and they know what risks they're running. If you don't know what the rules are, then uh, it's much more risky. So we'll begin, uh, if this works. It doesn't, good, OK. So we'll begin at the beginning uh, with you, OK? And just so I get a basic understanding of what's important for you, uh, I'm going to ask you these questions. What type of presentations do you need to prepare for your professional life? What do you find most difficult about presenting? And what feedback do you get from your bosses or, let's say, people who evaluate your uh, presentations on how effective they are? Okay? So those are the three questions that I'm going to ask you to uh, answer. Just for two minutes, just I know that at the beginning, Monday morning, uh, people are a bit tired. I'm going to allow you just to speak to the people next to you. Okay? And then I'm going to just bring out the main points and write them on the, the whiteboard there. Okay, so two minutes with the person next to you. I'd like you just to discuss these things, and then in plenary, we'll pull out your answers and put them on the whiteboard. Data heavy. Okay, so informing people, but also in um, motivating them as well. Okay, okay, so informing and motivating. Okay, super. Yeah. Anything else? No? Oh, that's nice and easy. Okay, you're going to make my life easy. Now, next question. What do you find most difficult about presenting? Either data heavy or convincing potential sponsors or informing and motivating. This is the important one for me because it's about you. <coughs> Emotions. Okay, right, okay. Emotions. Uh-huh. The objective. The objective. Okay, so right. To be clear. Okay. Time limitation. Okay, okay, okay. Uh-huh. Time limits. Right, so we say interact uh, with the presentation and with the audience. Okay. Uh-huh. Anything else? Anything else? The people who've just come in, the question is, what do you find most difficult about presenting? So make difficult easy. OK, OK, super. So make difficult easy. Uh-huh. Anything else? No? OK, so just doing a, a, a quick wrap-up. Keeping your emotions under control, being clear, 
the fact that you never have enough time interacting both with the presentation and with the audience and creating uh, an easy way, something which is easy for the people to understand, even if it's very difficult yeah, from a point of view. Okay, is that it? Okay, what an easy audience we have today. Fine. Uh, finally, I'm not going to write it down. Huh? Um, what feedback do you get at the moment from your bosses about your presentations? Are they happy with your presentations? Do they say anything? Speak too fast. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, that's probably linked to emotions. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Uh huh. Okay. So data heavy density. Uh huh. Right. Be clear. Okay. Wonderful. How about the ladies at the back? Right. Sell yourself during the presentation. Okay. 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 Is that it? Right, fine. That gives me a very, very um, important start because I have about 500 slides here, which we will not see. We will not see 500 slides. I'm going to try and uh, structure our time together according to your needs, okay? So, more or less, my objectives, I'll show you them in a second, will be tailored, will be modified according to what you need. So, we'll be looking very much at these things here. And I'll be keeping this in, in mind, okay? And when we come back, right at the end, I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you to answer these questions, or let's say to, to give me some feedback on these things here. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, I'll give you an overall view. Hmm. An overall view of where I want to go. Uh, and uh, it looks like this. There are two main parts uh, when it comes to uh, presentation. The first one is preparation, and most of today will be linked to preparation. Because if you prepare really well, the second part is much, much easier. The second part is delivery, and most of the things that you were talking about are linked to delivery. But if you haven't prepared well, if you haven't thought very carefully about how to get the message across, it's very difficult to deliver well. So some of the messages we'll be speaking about today are delivery, specific delivery. And your needs are very much delivery. But the starting point is not delivery. The starting point is, is preparation. Okay? So let's say this. Most of it will be preparation. Any questions you've got, fantastic. We can speak about delivery. If we want to do something specifically on delivery, then my idea would be, that if there's a next time, you come with your presentations already here, and we do a workshop where you do the work and we do the feedback. Okay? So that will be specifically on delivery. Okay, guys? Just to keep in line with expectations. Um, my overview, my overview is going to be this. Okay? So uh, we start with presenter emotions and logic. So that's pretty much in line with somebody's idea of emotions you'll see that there's a very big difference between what a presenter thinks and what an audience thinks. Um, you know that, but maybe you're unaware of it when you're here, so we'll have a look at that. Um, then we will have a look at three different ways of looking at uh, present presentations and, and presenting in general. Uh, and my idea is that the more you understand about the three perspectives, the easier it is to create something of value for the people who are listening. We'll spend a lot of time on audience needs. That's why I wanted to know who you're speaking to, potential sponsors, um, students, uh, Congress. All of these have very different needs, so we'll be looking at the needs of the audience. We'll be looking at targeting your message to try and make sure that people go away with the greatest value possible, so making difficult easy. And finally, I'm going to give you a handout which allows you to go to the next step. So when you go out of here at 12, you'll have something that allows you to work on something specific for you. Yeah? Because unfortunately, there's no golden rule book. Uh, there's not the book of read this and you will be a perfect presenter. Since the starting point is everyone's different, everyone's got their own style. So the idea is how can we use what you need to do, and your style to create something which is useful for you and for the audience. Okay? That's the basic idea. We're going to begin right at the beginning with you. Oh, yes. I'm going to just put you under a bit of pressure. Let's see if we can play around with your emotions here. So, uh, there's something, a classic 
uh, exercise for presenting, which is called the elevator pitch. And the elevator pitch is this. You work in a very big company. You arrive on a Monday morning. You go into the skyscraper. And you go into the lift, the elevator. And you find that you're by yourself next to the super, super big boss, the CEO. And you've got 30 seconds to sell yourself to the boss. That's the idea of the elevator pitch. We're going to change it slightly for you, OK? And we're going to do this. Here's the objective. You're going to have 120 seconds to explain your job to everyone here. OK? Only 120. Now, I'm a generous man, so I'm going to give you three minutes to prepare. OK? Um, and a number of volunteers will be chosen to perform. Not everybody, but a number of volunteers. OK, so you have three bit minutes, ladies and gentlemen, beginning now. Um, and you will have 120 seconds. Those lucky people will have 120 seconds here with the gelato, with the microphone, to explain their jobs. OK, over to you. Time up. You ready? OK, uh, let's just make sure that this is working. We do this. Yeah, it's working. Hello, hello. Yeah, OK. Right, so we need a volunteer to begin with. So I'll just, comp I'll just shut my eyes. And it's the man in the Liverpool shirt. OK, a round of applause for the man in the Liverpool shirt. Ladies and gentlemen, come on up here. OK. So you have 120 seconds. The floor is yours. OK, uh, I work trying to understand bacterial communities. And for that, I use a simple model with using two bacterial species, two different bacterial species, which one is a pathogen, the other is a non-pathogen bacteria. The pathogen causes this olive knot disease on plants, and the endophyte does not cause the disease. But when you put these two bacteria together, the knot becomes even more aggressive, so bigger. So this is a very nice way to understand how two bacteria from different species could interact in a very specific niche which gives you a phenotype. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much. A round of applause, guys. Thank you. It's uh, four, 41 seconds there. Okay, short but sweet. Okay, little time for preparation. Now, you get a special prize. You get to choose the next volunteer. The next victim. Yeah, the next victim. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have a round of applause for this gentleman, please, guys? Hello everyone. Well, I work in a molecular pathology lab in a protein that's called TDP43 that is involved in, in, a, in a neurodegenerative disease. This protein is fine in aggregates in patients that suffer neurodegenerative disease. And what, what I'm doing now is trying to find the mechanism that is under this, uh, that, that the aggregate that's it's form when this protein is, is misfold. And what I'm actually doing now is studying the mechanisms of autoregulation of the mRNA of this protein. And well, that's it. OK, thank you very much. OK, a round of applause, guys. <laughs> it's 48 seconds there. No, almost 49. That's OK, OK. Right, uh, would you like to choose the next victim, please? Uh, vol volunteer, sorry, volunteer. Who's, who's the next volunteer? This girl. Are you talking of this lady here? OK, right, congratulations. The, now, the, the first challenge is how is she going to get out of that seat? Are you going to, yeah? She's, you can jump, you can jump, you can jump. You're going to choose afterwards, huh? <laughs> right, so the first is a little bit of acrobatics here. Oh, well done, okay, right. A round of applause for her, guys, come on. Okay, I'm a PhD student in Yeast Molecular Genetics Laboratory, and I'm working in a strain improvement by using the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and in mostly strain improvement for the bioethanol production. In Italy, uh, it came out that there's a big waste of the agricultural uh, uh, from the wood waste, and our purpose is to use this wood powder, the waste, uh, to produce the, uh, the ethanol by using the genetically engineered Saccharomyces cerevisiae. 
<laughs> Is that it? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you very much. A round of applause, please. Thank you. 36 seconds there. 36 seconds. Okay, um, well, just uh, two more people. So uh, who's, the, who's the last, uh, the, the, the penultimate person? Are you going to choose another victim? Maureen. Okay, right. A round of applause for Maureen, who's coming up here. And there are people saying, ha, ha, he's not going to choose me. This isn't the only exercise, guys. Huh? Hi everyone, so I also work in molecular pathology like RMS and I work on TDP43 as well. Uh, my project is trying to understand RNA targets of TDP43, so as Hermes mentioned, TDP43 um, aggregates in the cytoplasm which means it's depleted in the nucleus. So what my project is trying to understand is what RNAs in the nucleus end up being alternated. So expression levels, changes in splicing of these RNAs in relation to when TDP43 is in the nucleus or not present in the nucleus. And to do this, I'm using three <coughs> approaches. So basically doing bioinformatics, um, looking at two-dimensional protein gels, and uh, using splicing microarrays to understand changes in RNA. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> A huge 54 seconds there. Okay, the new record. And who's our final volunteer for this exercise? Nadia. Okay, right. So a round of applause for you. So Nadia, who is the last victim of this exercise. She's also going to have to jump off. Very athletic there. Um, I'm also a PhD student. I'm working in molecular biology, and my project is on senescence. So I'm trying to uh, set up a cell model in order to uh, transfect the cells with microRNA and see if I can revert the cells from senescent, a senescent phenotype to a proliferating phenotype. And the idea, the long-term plan for this is to see a link with aging-related degenerative diseases. And I need to keep talking or I'll make the record. <laughs> so. So far, I've been working with fibroblasts. I've transfected them with microRNA, and my control was SIP53. As you know, P53 is the gatekeeper of the cell and decides whether the cell goes into apoptosis or continues to divide. Um, and SIP53 increases proliferation <laughs> in senescent cells um, by twofold, and I've found microRNA, which can increase it by fourfold. So I'm hoping that there will be some interesting results coming from this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. One minute and one second. Congratulations. Okay, right, so that's the new record. Now, um, <laughs> why did I ask you to do that? Just because I like laughing at people? No, absolutely not. Um, because you get an idea of uh, how difficult it is to speak in public. It's only 120 seconds. It's speaking about something that you're an expert on. I mean, that's your job. So, we go to emotions. Um, how do you feel when you're here? What did you see when the people were here? Nervous. What, what made you think they were nervous? What did they do or they said that made you think they were nervous? The voice? Movement? Did you see? What sort of movements did you see? It was back and forth. And then what else was there? Was this? Yeah. Anything else that you saw in movements? The hands. Yep, sort of unnatural hand movement. Uh -huh. Anything else? Actually, you didn't do that. Sometimes the guys bring up their, their belt to their, their, you know, the armpit here, you know? <laughs> uh, we didn't get that. We did get, we got this. Yeah. So there are various things that maybe you wouldn't usually do, but you do do here. So what's happening? If I ask you to explain what you do in your job just sitting down to a person next to you, just one-on-one, -on -one, would you do that? Probably not. So what's happening here? Um, what's happening here is, is this. Okay, well, I, I'm not a super expert like yourselves in science, but we'll just keep it nice and basic. Um, so... What happens is when you're under stress, uh, instead of the rational, the logical thing, you get taken away by emotions. See, the logic is a wonderful idea, and uh, you were explaining, what can I say, 
logical points of view and logical scientific uh, exploration. And that's super. Apart from you were using emotions to do it. So let's just explain very quickly. Uh, let's take, uh, okay, just the visual of the five senses here. So let's imagine that this person here uh, doesn't like snakes. Uh, usually what happens is they're going to get a signal, a visual signal, and the signal is taken to the thalamus. The thalamus is a little sort of uh, a gatekeeper. Someone's speaking about gates. So a gatekeeper that decides where is the information going. If the information uh, is given to you in conditions where you feel in control and calm and relaxed, the information goes to the cortex in this, uh, this situation here, the visual cortex. So the last part of the brain to evolve. That's analysis, rational, clear thinking. All of those lovely things that we said were important. Be clear, make difficult easy. All the things that we're looking for. Okay, super. But there's one small problem. When you're tired, when you're upset, when you're under pressure, when you're emotional, the thalamus plays a little game with us. It allows the signals to take a shortcut, and it goes through the amygdala, and the amygdala is at the end of say, so the most archaic part of the brain, the animal parts, the emotional seat uh, of the brain. So basically what happens is the signal is hijacked by feelings. And that's why we do things we just wouldn't usually do. Now, I asked people to come up here because I knew that you were going to get videoed. So you can get a chance to watch yourself on video. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's you, you, or a podcast, isn't it? Okay, super. You can see again and again. And you can, did I really do that? I, I can't, that's not me, is it? Yes, it is you. It's not your cortex, it's your amygdala that's taken over. Um, and this is an interesting thing. Uh, basically, it's an emotional fast track. Uh, this is uh, Damasio, a very interesting Portuguese neurologist who works in the States now. Before you reason toward the solution of the problem, something quite important happens. You experience an unpleasant gut feeling. It's here. Oh, sorry. I just touched my microphone. It's here in the stomach, yeah? There's still room for using a cost-benefit analysis and proper deductive competence, but only after the automated step drastically reduces the number of options. That is, you are unaware that suddenly your options of behaving are reduced. In other words, it's easier to think there's only one way of doing it, or going into a panic. Yeah? So what we're going to try and do, hello, welcome. What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and understand how we can reduce the impact of this. You see, adrenaline is a good thing if you, challenge it, you channel it positively. If you don't, adrenaline plus the amygdala creates problems for us. So the first thing we saw here, emotions, the best way of dealing with this is to say, look, it's going to be an emotional roller coaster anyway, because it's not normal for one person to stand up and everyone else to sit down. One speak and everyone's silent. That's not normal. So you're going to get adrenaline anyway. If you can channel the adrenaline, super. If you can't, you're basically allowing the amygdala to take control. Um, I was reading a study of things that people are most scared of, you know? So they did a list, the top 10 things that people are afraid of. Number one was shark attacks. I don't know, have you been attacked by a shark recently? Probably not. So shark attacks. And the second one is presenting in public. People waking up at night and dreaming that they had to present naked in front of people. Amazing. Yeah, you had that. Yeah, it happened to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my idea is, look, given the fact that it's not normal for me to stand up and you to sit down, me to speak and you keep silent, what can we do to try and minimalize this? Yeah, what can we do to try and help ourselves? Uh, basically, a good idea would be, what's the relation? What's the difference? The difference, the dichotomy between the speaker and the listener. So you saw four, five different speakers here. If I ask you how many presentations you've watched in your careers, hundreds, thousands? 
So you as listeners are really excellent. I mean, thousands of presentations you've attended. So you know what you like and what you don't like, yeah, as listeners. So taking into consideration the four or five presentations here and the thousand presentation that you've seen so far in your life, um, I'm going to ask you, what makes it difficult to follow a presentation? So what's difficult about understanding presentations? Uh, and I've asked this to many people, and I've got a list of mm, 15 items, OK? Uh, now, they're not the only items, but very often they come up as being something that creates difficulty. So I'm going to show them to you, and I'm going to ask you, just with the person next to you, to choose the five factors that you find most difficult from these 15. Okay? So 15, I'll explain them quickly. You choose five that for you create problems as a listener, not as a presenter. Clear? Okay. So, here we go. Number one, grammar errors. So, uh, instead of using the present perfect continuous, you use the present perfect simple. Second one, vocabulary difficulties. Uh, you're not sure about the word. You have to use another word because that's not the precise word. It doesn't come to mind. Number three, mispronunciations. So you say here in Italy the classic is management instead of management. Okay, number four, a wrong word stress, rhythm, and intonation. So the music doesn't sound right. Number five, sentences are too long. So you keep on speaking and speaking. There's not a comma or a full stop. It just keeps on going, this flow that never finishes. Linked to this, insufficient pausing, fast speech. I think somebody said, yeah, my, uh, uh, my boss says you speak too quickly. Number seven, Ideas not presented in a logical sequence. You have a fact, a fact, a fact, a fact, no links. Number eight, not enough language showing the structure of the presentation. This is called uh, signposting language or process language. Uh, for example, for example, basically all of the words that help you understand where you are in the presentation, not the content, but everything around it. That finishes the first point. Let's move to the second point. That's process language. OK? Now let's have a look at the next graph. That's process language. So not the content, but all of the pieces around it that help you understand where you're going. Literal translation. So you take something which is normal in your language, and instead of translating the sense, you translate word for word. I'll just give you an example here for Italy. I know my chickens. If you don't understand what I know my chickens is, no problem. Your Italian colleagues will explain to you at coffee break. Okay. <laughs> so, number 10. Saying what they want to say rather than what they can say. So, there is not an alignment between my objective and my ability to speak. Now, I'm sure you know some researchers who are brilliant researchers in terms of their research process, but they're unable to transmit that knowledge. So they're fantastic locked away in a lab, but they can't get that knowledge to people. So there's a difference between what I want to say and my ability to transmit that information. Number 11, assuming the audience has more knowledge of the subject than they do. Okay, so basically talking over their heads so they don't understand the, the, uh, the content. Number 12, not enough use of visual aids. Okay, visual aids could be slides or they could be uh, either the whiteboard, they could be handouts, but anything that helps you visually to understand the message. Two left. A lack of examples to explain difficult concepts. I know three left. That's obvious, I think. Number 14, a lack of explanation of unknown words, so jargon. Yeah, like for me, SP153 or something, I can't, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> somebody said, as you know, SP13, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, and finally, a lack of energy generated. 
In other words, they don't get people excited, in inverted commas. They don't motivate. OK, so you've got 15 factors. Now, of course, there are other factors that create difficulties. But let's just take this 15. And all I want you to do now is just to write down, not the sentences, the numbers of the five factors that create the most difficulty for you as a listener to follow a presentation. So here we go. Uh, we'll start with, what is it? We've got number seven, I think, is our first place. Yeah. So the biggest problem for us as listeners, and you are expert listeners to presentations, is ideas not presented in a logical sequence. Then we go to, I think, a lack of energy generated, I think, number 15. Uh, and then we go down to insufficient pausing fast speech. There's something really weird here. And then number 11. There's something very strange here. Every time, every time I use this, I always get the same results. Always get the same. I can be speaking to scientists or commercial people or accountants, anyone, and it's exactly the same. In first position, always, always is number seven. Now, you say, so what? Well, here's the thing that surprises me. When you're up here, when you're here for your 120 seconds or your 30 seconds, what are you concerned about? What are you worried about when you're here? When the amygdala has you, what are you worried? Are you worried about presenting ideas in a logical sequence? No. No. Are you, idea are you uh, worried about a lack of energy generation? No. What are you worried about here? You're worried about, what should I say? They're looking at me. Of course they're looking at you. You're the only person standing up there. Huh? You're the only person speaking. Of course they're looking at you. What am I going to say? Isn't it interesting? When you're here, the concerns are language concerns. But you know what? The audience doesn't care. Grammar errors, zero. Vocabulary difficulties, zero. Mispronunciations, two. A lack of explanation of unknown words, one. Language difficulties are not the main priority for an audience. Isn't that funny? The same person has two completely different ways of living presentations. When you're sitting down, you know what you want. You want structure. You want links. You want all of the things that you've said here. Clarity, interaction, making difficult easy. The things you said. Because I asked you, basically, from the point of view of the audience here, well, what's important here? But when I'm standing up, same person, instead of thinking about those being the key elements, I'm worried about what am I going to say? I find that very amusing, very strange, yeah? Because we're human beings. That shows the difference between logical expectations, audience, and the amygdala, the emotional part. So. If the audience says, we want this stuff, we've got to give them this stuff. And the more we spend our time on this stuff, the easier it will be to make them happy. Really simple. It's a little bit like this. When you're here, you feel that all the lights are like this. You know a rabbit when you're driving and suddenly there's a rabbit in your headlights and it just stays there like that? Yeah? That's how many people live presenting. And that's when the amygdala says, OK, now I'm going to play some games with you. Yeah? But actually, if we're able to take this light and, say, metaphorically, shine it on the audience and put the audience in number one position, then it makes it much easier. You see, I don't have the luxury of feeling nervous. I'm going to have to spend all of my time concentrating on the needs of the people who are in front of me. I don't have time to say, ah, what should I say? So the rest of today is going to be dedicated to how can we create the basics necessary for what the audience wants. And that's very much in the preparation. And that makes delivery much, much easier. Now, you can say, so wait, when you prepare a presentation, does that mean you give exactly that presentation to the audience? Never. But it gives you a very solid basis, foundation, to then adapt in real time. 
So the rest of our time will be basically looking at how can you prepare? How can you make it easier to create the needs for the audience? Remembering that the audience wants logical sequencing. It wants information given at a, a rate that it can absorb, which would be number six. It needs to have energy. It needs to feel that it's involved. So all of these things need to be first and foremost in our minds. We have to remember those are the things they want. OK, any questions so far? So the main thing we've seen so far is there's a dichotomy. Presentations for the presenter. What am I going to say? And presentations for the audience. I want structure. I want information that I can understand. OK? And the same person can live presentations in two very different ways. Given the fact that the audience is the king, we need to spend our time on thinking, how can we send the message in a way that makes sense to them? And we're going to do that by looking at how to prepare in a strong, solid way. OK? Right. We're going to move on. And we'll move on to something by someone called Daniel Offman, interesting guy, a Dutch man. And he said, look, there are three different perspectives you can have on the world. And people tend to give more interest to one perspective rather than another one. If you only see the world through one perspective, then you think that everything in the world is that. And all solutions are that as well. And he said, no, you shouldn't do that because different people have different perspectives. So the more you can understand the world from different perspectives, the more you can offer something in line for everybody, not just from your perspective. Let's have a look at what they are. So there's the it perspective. It not in information technology. It as in uh, an object, a neutral object. And he talks about it being facts, tools, structure, content, analysis, logical stuff. Yeah, like the cortex of the brain, um, something which is uh, measurable, basically very much linked to the jobs that you do. When your colleagues came up here for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, one minute and one second, most of their information was it information, fact. Okay, and that's great. But if presentations are only fact, then you're going to find it very difficult, very difficult to convince potential sponsors and inform by motivating as well. You're going to find it difficult creating something which is easy and digestible. So fact is important, but it's not the only thing we have to look at. Here's another worldview. I. I is about energy. Uh, I coming from me. So the energy I have to bring to the presentation, my attitude, so how am I feeling, my approach, reflection, impressions, commitment, inspiration, if you want vision, big picture, how enthusiastic am I? Okay. Now, this can change massively. There can be some days when you're not feeling 100% and that's difficult, and other days when you're feeling super and that's great. You can come in front of an audience and you look at them and there is zero feedback from them or they're all on their iPads. But you still have to present. <laughs> yeah. So this changes dramatically from moment to moment. And finally, we've got we. And we is everybody else around. So teamwork or interactivity, group dynamics, relationship, improvising, listening, it's basically the context. And often says, look, you have to work on all three perspectives. And it's absolutely true also for presenting. I'm going to guess that most of you spend most of your time in preparing and giving presentations in the it world. And that's great. But my suggestion is we need to think also about the I and the we. We need to think about your style, your style. How can we create a style which is in line with you so that you can feel comfortable and that you can give your best? Yeah, the idea is not, I don't want to create lots of little Tims because you're not Tim. I'm Tim. 
but I want to create a style which is in line with who you are, so you're able to give your best. That's all you can give, your best, right? But it's also very important that we take into consideration the situation around us. Because there's no such thing as a standard presentation. It doesn't exist. Oh, unless you have a standard audience. I've never met a standard audience in my life. They're always different. So when people speak about the standard presentation, that doesn't really exist. That's just a lazy way of doing it. You need to create something which is content-based, it, which is in line with how you can give your best, but is also targeted to the situation. And if I forget one of these pieces, probably I'm not going to be effective. So if we want to take this and we want to put it into our idea here, process, fact, content, that's the it world, very important. The rules. I'll be showing you some basic rules of communication. These basic rules exist because they work. Can you break the rules? Absolutely you can break the rules, but you need to know what the rules are and you need to know what the risk is of breaking them. If you go onto YouTube, you can find lots of super presenters. Most of them break the rules, but they know what they're doing. They know how to break the rules well. So I'll show you the rules and I'll explain why they exist but it doesn't mean that you can't bend them if you want, don't want to. Uh, the vision, the big picture, the excitement, that comes from you. And finally, and I think most importantly for us today, the context. Understanding the context, the starting point. Okay, so we'll be spending lots of time here. We'll be going towards the end looking at what you can do. Yeah, so a personal action plan about what you can do and the process as we go along. The content is yours, but the process, the communication rules um, linked to, what can I say, uh, group dynamics, I'll give you that. Okay, so that's how we're going to work. Um, I've got a question for you guys. My question is this. What's the difference between reading a PowerPoint and watching a PowerPoint? If I send you my PowerPoint and that's it, there are some positives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the reader can think about the data or whatever is the context of the... Right, because... So you can immediately process it logically and think about what you're doing. You can think about because you don't have the time limit. Because I'm reading it in my time. Yeah, so if I want to spend one minute or one hour or one day, if I have that, possibility, I can do that. So the amount of time I dedicate to each piece is up to me, the reader. And that's a huge benefit. And, and somebody who spoke about time limits, you're right, there's a problem. There's never enough time in presentations to give you everything. So there has to be a selection. There has to be. So that's a positive thing about reading a presentation. However, <laughs> there are lots of negatives, which is basically... The I and the we have been cut out. <laughs> yeah? Oh, and one other small thing about the, the it, the content. You see, when you read my presentation, you read from your point of view, not from mine. There's no direct feedback. I don't know if you're understanding in the way I want you to understand. Yeah, I have no idea. So there is a huge difference between reading a presentation and watching a presentation. That's why if you, when you give a presentation, all you do is read the slides, the audience says, just send me the PPT. So I'm not using this moment in the best way. So reading slides is not giving a presentation. Reading slides is simply auto-cueing, reading a presentation, that's it. Yeah, you're not using this special moment because it's a very special moment. There are two different types of communication. One is reading in my own time, in my own space. And the second one, well, the second one is the potential for an interaction between a group of people. That's very different. It's real time. You get feedback. If you're following all of the communication rules, you know exactly who is following you and who isn't. 
you can look in their eyes, and if their eyes are like this, you know you don't have them. Yeah? So <laughs> you've got real-time feedback that you don't have if they're reading your PPT on their computer. So big, big difference. OK, that's why Marshall McLuhan said that there's a huge difference between the medium and the message. So one thing is a report, another thing is a presentation. There is a dangerous precedent, especially for scientists, scientific, uh, let's say, the scientific community, which is here is the report. I'll just take the report and squeeze it into PowerPoint. No, that doesn't work. A report is one thing. A report is for reading through. A report is giving you everything, the whole thing. You can go into super detail, but that's not the same objective of a presentation. So you have two different communications with two different sets of rules. Very often what people do is they start with the documentation and they say, OK, let's just put all of this into bullet points. Mm, that's not going to work because all you're going to get is simply 1,000 slides. Yeah. The other day, I saw a presentation. It was a one-hour presentation. Uh, was uh, for um, a, a company in Alba, so a, a big international company that makes chocolates, especially chocolates that you can put on. I'm not going to tell you the name. Um, and, uh, and one of the groups had, uh, one of the groups had for one hour, 167 slides. And I said, guys, you do the maths. I'm not a numbers person, but you just divide the amount of time and the slides. How many seconds per slide is that? That's, that's not a presentation. That's like an interrogation, yeah? That's slapping people around with, with information. Now, how can, you, how can you manage to take that? That's a saturation point. You just stop. Yeah? So, no good. The medium is the message. And in terms of the message, guys, the message has to be targeted to your audience. Now, you say, okay, fine. Tell me about an audience. Okay, I'll tell you about the audience. This gentleman, Carl Rogers, fantastic psychologist, and he said this. Our first reaction to most of the statements which we hear from other people is an immediate evaluation. So we judge, we judge, yeah? rather than of an understanding of it. Um, when I arrived here, when did you start judging me? Come on, you can be honest. We're friends now. Really? OK. OK. Um, because I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that actually you start judging me before I even open my mouth. This, the moment you see the person, you say, ah, that's the presenter. You're saying, oh, look, oh, hey, he's short. Oh, no, 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 that, that, that tie doesn't go with his glasses. Yeah, you're, you're automatically making judgments, automatically, before I open my mouth. And what Carl Rogers says is, that's just human nature. So when I open my mouth, you're already got half a, an idea about whether you like me, you don't like me, it's positive, negative. You've already got those feelings inside you. And this is interesting. <laughs> it says, basically, the audience is not interested at the beginning in trying to understand your message. They're judging you. What does that mean? It means something very, very important. It means that if you come here and in the first two seconds you're already pushing information on them. They're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. So it's wrong. Even though you have a limited amount of time, it's wrong for you to say, OK, and then throw yourself into the detail. It's too early. It's too early. What you need to do to begin with is something which is the opposite, which is pull. What does pull mean? Pull means taking information from the context, the we. Hello, good morning. You're almost in time for coffee. Huh? <laughs> so pull is taking information from the context. Oh, 
We have a movement here, and a white coat as well. That's very impressive. Do you, would you like to take a seat? Or you, if you prefer standing up, that's fine, but you can take a seat as well. Now I know I'm in the Audi chair. OK, fantastic. I've got a white coat, a real white coat. Now this is, again, this doesn't seem to be obvious, but you say, if I have a limited amount of time, then I have to hit them with as much fact as possible. No, no, because then they reach saturation point. OK, fine. So I can reduce the amount of information, yes. But before you start on the information, you need to remember that you need to create a relationship with the audience every time. Because if you don't do it, they won't listen to you. They'll just be evaluating. So the first thing you have to do is not give them facts, but to create a relationship. And that can be in any presentation. Now, depending on the presentation, the relationship will change, but this is very, very important. You need to create a relationship. So starting point is always create a relationship with the audience. Always. That's an investment of time, not a waste of time. If you don't do it, then the audience isn't ready. Basically, I'm going to suggest that an audience asks three questions, three basic questions. If you don't answer the questions before you go into the content, they don't listen to you. So, basically, you have to answer the questions. And the first question is, why am I here? Not existential, not what is life. But why am I sitting down in this seminar room? Okay, so basically, what's the purpose? An audience needs to know what is the purpose. What's the motive here? Yeah, that's very true. But then I would say the most important thing of all, of all, is this one. Why should I listen? Why should I listen? What's the value for me? Because if you're not going to give me value, I've got lots of other things to do. I can do them concretely, or I can just think about them. Yeah, I can't force you to listen. Either I can convince you to listen, or you're not going to do it. So what's in it for me? What's the value? What's the takeaway for me? Uh, the Americans call this the benefit statement. It's one sentence which sells you the value. If it's not there, they're not going to listen to you. It doesn't matter how many slides you have, how much detail you've got, how much it you've got, they're not going to listen to you. So this is very much from the, the I world, but the I world meaning the audience's I world. If I can't create something of value for you, you're not going to listen. So if I know that in the audience you guys really like red pens, red pens are the top for you guys. And I say, OK, so we're going to speak about uh, international presentations. And uh, if you listen to me carefully, you get a red pen. Uh, he's, he's, he's really into it now. He's going to listen to. So you have to do a lot of work beforehand understanding why should the audience listen to me? And very often, people just forget about that. They say, it's obvious. Is it? Well, it should be. <laughs> well, it should be is wrong. So what's the value? Why should I listen? And finally, what do we have to do? I mean, yeah, you speak because you're the presenter. But, but we? What, what do we do? I mean, how long do we have to sit here for? Well, you know, you've got until 12. So that's... But if I say, welcome to a brief presentation, how much is brief? Maybe brief is five minutes for this lady, but it's 10 for this guy. And this lady, after two, is already bored. So we're going to have to be careful here. Um, how long is this? And also, when can we ask questions? Can we ask questions whenever we want? Is there a certain point when we can ask questions? What's our role? Now, the idea is, if I, in the first 30 to 60 seconds, can give you some answers to this, you'll be ready. So basically, the first maximum minute, minute and a half, is creating the frame of the relationship between me and you. That's all. Not content. It's nothing to do with it. It comes afterwards. So our starting point is, I give you what you need to listen to the content. And then I go into content. Now, this sounds very easy, but it's not. Because you have to choose what's relevant for your audience. And to do that, you need to understand your audience. Um, Dale Carnegie, 
said this. I love strawberries, but whenever I go fishing, I bait my hook with worms. This is because fish like worms, not strawberries. Yeah. So very often we forget that we're not creating the presentation for us, we're creating the presentation for them. So you have to put yourself in the shoes of the audience. If you don't do that, then you risk. Oh, unless you can tell me the audience is exactly the same as you. Probably not. Yeah. So the starting point is the audience itself. Um, in order to do that, you need to do some market research. Um, I'll just go through this. I'll send you all the slides so you can look at them in your own time. But here's something called a presentation planner. It's really simple, but it gives you an idea of the sort of work you have to do before you start the presentation. And there's a lot of work to do. Now, some of this information is easy for you to get. Some of it's not so easy. The more information you get from this, the easier it will be to create something of value for your audience. I'll go through it, and I'd like you to tell me why the information is important. Okay? So, who am I presenting to? Number, names, participant, background, orientation. We'll start with number. Why is it important for me to know how many people are going to be in the presentation? Absolutely. There's a huge difference between two and 200 and 2,000. It changes completely the dynamics, but also the layout of the room and everything else. Uh -huh. How about names? What, what information can names give me that are important? If I have a list of your, just your family names, I know if I have an international group or not. It's really simple, yeah? I am able to understand more or less how many Germans are here. I can understand more or less uh, how many Italians and so on. So it gives me a basic idea of how mixed is the audience just from a list of surnames. That's all, family names. Participant background, very useful. Yeah, because the more I have a sort of uh, a homogeneous group, the easier it will be to target the message. Orientation to us. You, maybe I think, you know, this is the first time I've speak, spoken to these guys here, but if they read the flyer, then they know that I work for this organization. And if two years ago, you went to that school and you had a bad experience, then when I walk in here, you say, oh yeah, he's that guy from that school. So, orientation to us. If I understand how Ari Di Ricerca thinks about the school, I'm walking in here and I'm anticipating a situation. So, even basic stuff like this helps me understand the starting point, the attitude. Okay, next one up. When and where will I be presenting and with what facilities? When? Time. Why is time important? I mean, not, not amount of time, but, but when? When? Day? Month? Monday morning. Oh, Monday, yeah. Monday morning and it's grey sky outside. And it has been grey all the week and he's, oh no, I got that presentation as well. Listen, if I come late, will he realize? I, I know, I'll walk in with a white coat. Then I'll, it looks like I'm busy. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> joke. Yeah. So, so, basically, there are moments when you know the energy level in the audience is going to be low. Yeah? If usually Friday afternoons, you have Friday afternoon off, and I say, we have a special presentation on Friday afternoon, yeah? and it's sunny outside, and your friends have said, let's go to the beach, and you say, no, I have to be in a presentation, then it's going to have an impact. Just before holidays, just after holidays. Uh, five o'clock in the afternoon, just after lunch, when your stomach is beginning the digestive process. All of those things have an impact on how you're going to listen, how active you're going to be. Facilities, where well, we're talking about uh, do you have audio, do you have visual, and so on. Once I went to a, a hotel, I was supposed to do three days, and there was the um, presentation package. Uh, so the company had bought the presentation package, and I arrived in a, a room, and uh, there were no chairs, and there was nothing there. N no <laughs> projector, n no whiteboard, nothing. And I said, um, do you have a whiteboard? And they said... Did you ask beforehand? And I said, so what's part of the presentation package? And they said, the room. 
OK. So, so very important to check the facilities here, guys. OK. Moving on quickly. What's the purpose of the presentation? What do I want from the presentation? Giving for granted that people understand the purpose is a huge mistake. Just coming to speak about the content, that's not the purpose. So what's the objective? What's the objective? What do I want out of this three hours? What do the audience need from my presentation to allow me to get to the result? Sometimes a presentation is part of a series of actions that persuade people. It's just one. Very often we live the presentation like it's by itself, but it's not often by itself. So you have a number of things that put together influence, convince people. Let's take your sponsors. Okay, let's say this. Someone said, convince potential sponsors. Is your presentation the only thing that's going to convince the sponsors? Probably not. A number of other things. So I have to understand where is the presentation in the overall process? What little piece is that going to allow me to influence? Next one up. What's the single most important message I wish to convey throughout the presentation? It's just one sentence. I'll tell you already my sentence to you. In three hours, if you go away, walk out of that, that door, and you uh, remember that the most important thing is the context, then I'm happy. You think, wow, three hours for that? But I'm going to have to do a lot of convincing. So that's the most important message for me. You have to condense it down to one sentence. That's difficult. If you are thinking about it and facts, it's very difficult. What other messages do I want to transmit? That's pretty obvious. What complications or objections should I predict and be prepared for? You know, it would be wonderful if you walk into a presentation and everyone says, we love you. We'll just listen and believe in everything you say. But that doesn't happen. So <laughs> you're going to have to spend some time before saying, mm, wait, with this audience, are there going to be problems? Is there going to be a more delicate thing? Am I going to have to be careful about this? Am I have to work more on this? So understanding that there will be complications is useful as well. Now, you can see here, that's a lot of work you have to do before you start thinking about content. Lots of work. It's market research. And you could say, bah, who cares? Well, you're going to make your life very difficult, and you increase the chance of the amygdala hijacking your message if you don't have this information. So the more you're able to get this information before, before you start planning, the easier it is. Now how can you do that? You can speak to the organizers. You can speak to people who are going to be part of the presentation. There are various ways. But the more research you do before, the easier it will be to have the background information. And then you can start trying to apply that to your message. So what I'm going to do is this. You can already get your brains ready for it. You're going to come back, and I'm going to ask you to work in little groups of three. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to work on just the opening, so the first 60 to 90 seconds of a presentation. And the presentation will be about your work, so one of you will choose to be the volunteer. Okay? And we will work on just the opening part, so not the content, but the creating the relationship. Because I know that when you're here, you're worried about the words, I'll give you a mini guide to structured language. So I'll give you the words, OK? So here are all the words. So you've got the words. All you need to do is think about how to target the information to your audience. That's all. So the idea is, I'm going to give you, first I'm going to give you a handout. The handout gives you all the structural language you need for the opening. The opening is the first 60 to 90 seconds. The opening has one objective, to create the right conditions for people to listen to you. That's all. Yeah? In the opening, you have a choice. You have a choice. There are a number of elements. All of the things that you said here, plus the benefit statement. You'll find that here on this brief handout that I gave you, the first, where are we? Hmm. The first page in a bit is dedicated to the opening language. Now, 
Do you always have to have all of the elements in the opening present? No, it depends on the audience. Yep. So I'm going to allow you to think about which elements need to be there. The benefit statement must be there. All you have to do is create the opening 60 to 90 seconds. That's all. That's all. It's about your work. So you choose one of the guys from the three or four. That's the person who you're going to be helping to organize the opening 60 to 90 seconds. Use the structural language to help you. And you're saying, so what about the audience? I will come and give you an audience. Some of the audiences are difficult. Some of the audiences are very difficult, OK? Uh, it's designed to try and help you understand how challenging it is to transform your normality into something that makes sense to a very different world, OK? Uh, oh, I'll just go through it very quickly. So introductions, OK, then, can we start? Shall we start, then, is a nice way of saying, shut up, we're beginning, OK? Sometimes people begin and the audience doesn't know they've begun, so you're wasting your time. So, okay then, can we start is shut up, but in a nice way. Uh, good morning, nice start. Uh, introducing yourself, that's what you told me was important, and you're right. Uh, introducing the topic, again, uh, you said was important. And look, guys, the most important thing for me is, uh, for that paragraph, introducing the topic, are the last words. So I'm going to explain to you today about so that you can, so that you will be able to. That is the benefit statement. That has to be important for them. Yeah? So I'm going to do this, and it will give you that. And that must be a value, perceived value for them. If you can't find perceived value for them, why should they listen? That's the really tough thing. That's the difficult thing. That's where you need to be creative. Okay. Uh, outlining the main points. OK, that's just a road map. Mm, going across, um, if you just flip the page. Duration. And then finally, guys, we've got here encouraging dialogue. Uh, this is really important. Um, you can decide when they ask questions. If you want it to be interactive, the positive thing is that's good. You get lots of feedback. But if you say, please feel free to interrupt me if anything's not clear, it means they will interrupt you when they want. So if you're not feeling comfortable, don't do that. Yeah? If you need to have more confidence, you need to feel more control over things, then uh, think about other ways. For example, if you have any questions, could you make a note of them and we'll deal with them at the end? Or I'm going to divide this brief presentation into three parts, A, B, and C, and I will dedicate um, time for questions and answers at the end of each section. So you make it clear for them what's the interaction. OK? That's it. That's the only thing. The only things you need for the first 60, 90 seconds. Depending on the audience, you decide what are the relevant elements. You decide what's the relevant order. So everything is targeted to your audience. OK? Now, I will come now. I will allow you to choose one of these interesting audiences. Yeah? You will have 10 minutes. Do not show the piece of paper to any of the other groups. Because after 10 minutes, we will ask one lucky person from each group to come here. They will have 60 to 90 seconds. And then, if they've done a good job, you should be able to guess what's written here, if they've done a good job at targeting. OK? Ready? Let me just explain. This is just very simple exercise, simple, simple on paper, a very simple exercise of how easy is it to translate my normality into a normality that is of value for the audience. That's all. I'm not asking you to look at content. I'm only asking you to look at the first 60 to 90 seconds, the opening part. Yeah? The Americans call this prime time, because if you get them at the beginning, then it's much easier to work with them. If you don't, they won't listen to you. So it's very important to have a strong opening. Um, mm. Please do not try and help us understand what's written on your piece of paper with ridiculously obvious things. For example, if you have a piece of paper that says, a group of Japanese businessmen, I don't want you to say, 
How was your trip from Tokyo? Yeah, I don't want that. that that's not... Yeah. So everything has, to, everything has to help us rather than just one word or one obvious action. Okay. Right, are you ready? So the idea is we bring out our victims one at a time um, and we ask them to give the opening. If you're listening, guys, you have two things to do. The first thing to do is to recognize which elements of the opening they used. You've got the sheet there. But second, you have to listen carefully because I'm going to ask you at the end what was written on their piece of paper. If they've done a good job, you will be able to understand what's written in just 60 to 90 seconds without welcome from Tokyo. Okay? Are we ready? Okay, uh, can we start, guys? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, good morning, everybody. And uh, I am uh, Luca. I am a medical doctor. And uh, I'm here today uh, to um, speak with you about uh, diabetes and, in particular, the relation between diabetes and lifestyles. Um, the, the main goal uh, today for me is just to give you a very brief and simple, over, simple overview about this pathology. And we know that this is a big problem even for you and uh, uh, for the situation in which you are right now. And in particular, we know that your lifestyle is uh, quite um, um, affected by uh, your uh, situation. And so we want to stress uh, about how you can uh, better deal with this pathology and uh, counteract, counteract his uh, ongoing, just uh, uh, working on your lifestyle uh, inside this uh, building. Okay, thank you very much, right? Stay there. Stay there and get used to, get used to the fact that you can oh, see I, I people. I huh? the, the, the questions. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, no problem. So you cannot ask anything. <laughs> so uh, you could just get, get used to having a look at these smiling faces here, uh, and we'll just do a bit of feedback. So what elements did you hear from the opening? He said good morning, he said his name, his role, anything else? He forgot the questions, but okay. What about the benefit statement? What was the benefit statement? To deal better with the pathology. To deal better with the pathology. Okay, so deal, deal better with the pathology through lifestyle choices. Okay, so that was very clear. Okay, well done. So now that you know that they are prisoners in a high security prison, I told you they were difficult, huh? Wow. So what, what benefit do you think they could get? I mean, the guys did a good job because it's not easy. But what could we do to target it even better? So, guys, it's not easy. It's how can I target something that makes value to them? If I use their language, their approach, and, and their values, they'll listen to me. A round of applause. Well done, guys. Have a seat. Super. Not too much applause. Um, right. It's not easy, though. Huh? Now you can relax. Uh, we'll go to the second group. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Today I'm here, I'm Tia Carletti. I'm working in a research center, and today I'm here to explain you how to protect yourself against the tick-borne encephalitis virus that is an endemic virus here in Carso. And I'm explaining this because I know that a lot of you like to have daily walk around the Carso, so you have to know that this virus is transmitted by... Um, by a ticks that is, re <coughs> that is really common here uh, on the Howard Hills. And so feel free to ask me whenever the things are not clear or you have questions and we can discuss more, I can give you more details. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> stay, 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 stay. Have you noticed how they run away as soon as they can? <laughs> you get, get used to it. Look, you, you have yeah, a little yeah. look at, have a little smi smiling faces. Well, some of them are smiling. But yeah, so you just, you stay there. So what elements, what elements did you see in the opening? Who I am, Who I am? role, benefits. yeah. Benefits. Questions, benefits, okay, right. So benefit is how you can, <coughs> how you can get infected. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a benefit. Okay, <laughs> what's written on that piece of paper? Old people. Okay. Can you, can you uh, hikers? So uh, wait, 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 wait. Only old people walk around. Uh, in Trieste, only old people walk around. A group of naturalists want to enjoy the car. 
a, a group of naturists who want to enjoy the, the Carso is very, very specific. Okay, uh -huh. So obviously we're not, we're not talking about experts again. Huh? It seems to be quite general. People who like to go outside, okay. So not prisoners then, okay, okay. Uh -huh. uh, anything else? A local a local community meeting. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. What was written on your piece of paper? Retired people. Retired people. You got it right. Okay. How can we target it a little bit more to retired people? <laughs> yes. What could be better in the or your copious free time than to walk in the beautiful Carso Hills? Unfortunately, there's, yes, yes, in other, so, <laughs> a little, little bit more specific there, yes, okay, uh, because I mean, what, pensioners are concerned also about their health, definitely, so we have to be, so this idea of the health and the free time and so on, not bad, okay, congratulations there, well done, take a seat. <laughs> next one up, who's next? Oh, wow, we have, we have a real volunteer here, okay. There we go. Shall we start then? Good morning, ladies. Uh, my name is Nina, and my aim today here is to present you the, the fast and diagnostic method for um, uh, diagnosis if, if you are infected with a virus or not. Have you ever been bitten by a tick? Yes. yes. Uh, by a mosquito? Yes. yes. Uh, Okay, our diagnostic tool uh, will uh, tell you if you're infected by a West Nile virus, dengue virus, or uh, um, tick-borne encephalitis virus. This is quite important for you as you train in the grass outside. Um, and um, my, uh, my, um, uh, sorry, my purpose here today uh, is to present you this test for you to know as soon as possible if you're infected with the virus or not, to treat it as soon as possible before your next match. So feel free to interrupt me with your question and... Come back here. <laughs> They're running away. Get used to it. I know it's not normal, but get used to it. Yeah, okay, fine. Right, so you used a couple of very specific words there. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, first, before we go there, what, what elements were we were, were in the opening? Name? Name. Role? I didn't oh. hear the role. I didn't hear the role. No, no, okay. Okay, but we had some background here. Uh, yes, the motive. Uh, benefit statement was very clear. Yeah, to understand. This is a test to understand if you've got this huge amount of illnesses and viruses. Okay, okay, great. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, um, what was written on the piece of paper? Ladies. Okay. So just just said ladies. Now, either she doesn't like men, or it's something to do with a thing. A female. It could be a female group. Okay. So, ladies. Anything else? Training outside. Grass, matches, a football team, a, fo a female football team, okay, a female football team. Okay, I made it very difficult for you guys, ah, didn't I? Okay, so what's written on your piece of paper? The Swedish ladies football team, not just any football team, the Swedish ladies football team. Yes, you should, but I took that away as a chance there. Okay, now, uh, what can we do to make the presentation even better? How can we target it even more? Blondly. No, <laughs> not semantically. I'm talking conceptually here, not blondly. You, that's semantic, though, huh? So, I mean, that's fine. You can say it's good, good morning in Swedish, but in terms of the benefit statement and so on, if you're having a look at the group of people you're speaking to, so if you have athletes, athletes are, yes, very concerned, but they're also in incredibly well-trained as well. So we're going to make this link. It's very different between the retired people walking around the Carso Hills and people who every day are training. So we have to put ourselves in their shoes. What are their concerns? What are the things that they're worried about? What are the things that motivate them? And there's where the benefit statement has to be. Okay, well done. Thank you very much. She, she can give her a round of applause as well. Right, so we've still got another one, two, three groups. You ready? Okay. Is that a Grenbule? 
Well, okay, okay. I haven't seen one of those in years. Okay, no. It's, it's super. It's, it's, uh, with yeah, it's stylized. Grandma, my grandma. Your grandma, okay, okay. But you see, the grandmother has targeted it to make it especially added value, which is good. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Julia, and uh, I work in a research institute which is focused on heart uh, disease and biology. My purpose today is uh, to give you an idea of why this type of research could be important also for people doing sports. And uh, I divide my talk into parts. First, I will uh, tell you something about uh, heart pathologies, and then I will tell you on how we do research to uh, develop new therapeutics for heart pathology. And feel free to interrupt me for questions whenever you want. Okay, fantastic. Stop. Stay, wait there. Okay. You can, you, can, you can give a round. Come on. It's, applause is free. It's a, it costs you nothing, but it gives a huge benefit for the person who's there in front of you. So, hmm. Well, we know you're Julia, but also your grandmother helps us understand that you're Julia because of the G. Uh, so, a, a role, yes. Um, what's the benefit statement? Ah. Hmm? It seemed to me quite a general thing, so I've actually I've forgotten what's written on the piece of paper. Don't, 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 don't tell us yet. But just help us, uh, from what you heard, what type of audience is it? Sports. Sports. Athletes. And ath and all, yeah, I think you're just, after healthy retired people walking on the Carso and the Swedish national football team, ladies, went, you're, you're, you're convinced it's sports. Any, any other ideas? Okay, okay. What's, what else? I've forgotten what's written on your piece of paper. Bodybuilders. Okay, ah, bodybuilders. You know the guys who go to the gym all the time? Yeah? Um, how can we make bodybuilders listen to what we're going to say? Drugs. We're going to tell you how steroids are one key. <laughs> okay, it could be. What, what's, what's, important, what's important for bodybuilders? Yeah, but I mean, more than... Body, bodybuilders, the, the, their body is their temple, definitely. So everything is dedicated to their body. Yeah, uh, the whole world is dedicated to their body. So that's the way we're going to get through to them. Uh, it was... It was fine. It was a little bit generalized. I would have spent a little bit more time on how to make the body beautiful uh, and, and build up on that, because otherwise it seems a little bit standard. But I, I, she gets a round of applause anyway, guys. Thank you very much. Bring on, bring on the next victims. We've got another two, I think. Okay, so this lady here, and then we'll finish over here. Okay, if you're ready, we can start. Um, good morning to everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, we are very glad that among all the beautiful things here in Trieste, you choose to visit our center here in ICJB. And uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Annalisa Zekin. I'm a researcher working here. And my main goal today would be to let you understand what are we doing here in the institute, what are the principal area of research or the principal interest in science here. Uh, ICGB is a center of excellence, not only in Trieste, but in all Italy. So um, I will try to speak in a more simple way that I can because I don't, because I don't know if you have a really good background of science. Um, and uh, you can, of course, interrupt me whenever you can or whenever you want uh, or whenever you don't understand something. Thank you very much and let's start with the presentation. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> stay here, stay here. Come on. Usually I'm not so... I was no, you're staring at me. <laughs> Have a look at them whilst we, we, we feed back. So, I'm more good. Well, okay. We, but um, we're pressuring you on purpose to do that. So, uh, so what, what opening things do we see here? Name, yes. Uh, role, yes, more or less. Okay. Uh, benefit statement? Okay. So, explaining the institute. The mission of the institute. Okay. Uh huh. Um, what do you think was the, the group written on the piece of paper? High school students. High school students. 
Uh, is that because he said, oh, you don't understand anything about science? <laughs> okay, you're stupid. So, you're stupid. So, we'll, okay. so high school students are stupid. Okay. I, I, I would be so good explaining that that you will understand. It. Okay. <laughs> tourists. Okay. Yes, actually, written on the piece of paper is a group of tourists. Okay. Right. Well done. Um, how can we... Uh, this is quite difficult. How can we target it more? Mm. In this case here, yeah, there were certain things. Okay, you've all the wonderful things about the, you've done. You've done Miramare, you've done Piazzonetta, and now Ari di ricerca. Okay, yeah. but that yeah, it wasn't bad at all given the idea. So thank you very much indeed. Please take a, a seat. And we finish off with the last group. You ready? Okay. Hi guys, um, I'm Francesca and I am a scientist and today we will play together in our lab. What is a lab? It's a place where we can play with the cells. What is a cell? Do you know what is a cell? What are cells? So our body is made of cells. So cells are like Lego blocks. Do you know the color, small little stuff? Okay, Lego blocks. We are made all of, all, all of the different blocks and different colors are different parts of the body. So today in the lab, in our fantastic lab, I will show you how we can watch a different type of cells using a microscope and I will show you also different type of microscope so you can directly look at the different color blocks uh, that we have in our body. And we, here we are not a school, so if you don't understand something, ask me and I will uh, play with you and I will teach you how to discriminate between different type of blocks. Is it fine? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It was, not so easy. it was not so easy, was it? No, it wasn't so easy. And I heard one child say, what does discriminate mean? But okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, that was not bad at all. Uh, what was, how old? Eight. Six, seven. TV show for kids. Kindergarten. Okay, what's written on the? Five years, five years old. Five years old. Now, in order to do that, this was, this was a difficult test. How do you take something which you know normally without thinking about and transform it into something that makes sense to someone who's five years old? It's difficult. Everything has to change. Everything. Yeah? And I thought you did a very good job there. It's not easy to do. You can't expect them to understand what is it, the, the, the IS-137 or something that was being <laughs> mentioned before. Uh, so you have to speak about Lego blocks. And that was, I thought that was, you did a very good job there. It's no point saying, hello, this is, I'm a research student of oh, this and this and this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's keeping it nice and simple. So well done. Please take a seat. Thank you. <laughs> I, I did this exercise once with um, someone who works for McKinsey. It's a um, management consultancy uh, uh, from Germany. And his name was Frank, fantastic guy. Uh, and I said, hey, listen, Frank, I want you to create a 45-minute um, presentation on, on your job on uh, management consultancy to five-year-olds. Yeah? But I gave him a lot of time, a lot of time to do it. And it was just a one-to-one. -one. And so he went away and he came back. And it was similar to you. He started, hi, kids. My name is Frank. What's your name? You're shy, aren't you? What's your name? Sorry? Marina. Marina. What a lovely name. It reminds me of the sea. OK, now, okay great. This is nice. This, I like it. I like it. Fine. Your teacher asked me to come today to tell you about what I do for work. But before I do, I want to know, what do your mummies and daddies do? What does your daddy do? He's a businessman. Wow. Okay. What does your daddy do? Uh, he's retired. He's retired. He has to be careful when he's walking on the car so <laughs> not to get there. Okay. Good. Fine. I like this. But when is he gonna? When is he gonna get down to speak about management consultancy? Yeah? And then he said, "Now, I have a very special job, but the special job? No, no, no." I want to know about your toys first. What are your favorite toys? What's your favorite toy? A ball. A ball. A football. Oh, wow, great. OK. Huh? What's your favorite toy? A doll. Does anyone have a Barbie here? Yeah? Oh, OK. Right. Now, do you know where Barbies come from? 
Not from Ken. No, no, no. Barbie's come from a special house called a factory. And one day, the man who lives in the special house telephoned me and said, hi, Frank, can you come and help me? So I went to his house, and I knocked on the door, and I said, hi, how can I help you? And I said, this is fantastic. He's going to take us there to management consultancy. How can I help you? And the man said, Frank, I'd like to increase my market share. <laughs> and I, what's a market? What's a share? And he said, um, 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 he, here's a market and here's a share. No, no, sorry, I don't understand, Frank. Huh? But in the end, Frank was able to explain his job to five-year-olds. It just takes time and it takes the ability for you to move from your world to their world. So you take the lights that you feel when the amygdala's on you, and you put them on their world. And the more you do that, the less time you have to worry about what you're doing. Here's some things to help you a little bit. And I'll come straight back online here. There we go. So six ways to start a presentation. Here are some ways. A question, a rhetorical question. Yeah? Have you ever thought what happens when you go walking on the carso and you come back with an itch. Yeah, so a rhetorical question. I'm never going to go to the Carso again after what you've said. Eh? <laughs> Quotation. You can find lots of quotations around the place these days. You just go online. A comment on a local custom. If you're going to a different place than you usually go. Um, just arrived in, uh, here in, uh, in Trieste, and people had explained to me I had to be careful about something called the Bora. Yeah, so again, you go to the local customer and make a link with people. A comment that raises interest. A link to a fact which is highly valued by the reader uh, or the, the, uh, the listener. And a story with a moral. Here are some examples. Huh? Basically, they're just links. They're ways to try and get the audience interested. Once I've got the audience interested, I go straight into the opening. Opening 60 to 90 seconds, that's all. And then into the content. If I don't go first creating the relationship, I'm going to create some problems. Now, I've given you so far simply careful. The first thing to do is to think about the people in front of you. Second, create a relationship and then go to content. But how do you structure the content? Well, um, the relationship between me and you depends very much on cultures. In some cultures, the presenter is the expert. So automatically, if I am the expert, you are the non-expert. So there's a hierarchical difference. I know, you don't know. When there is an expert-non-expert relationship, Basically, my role is to give you everything I know. Your role is to take what you can take, and that's it. So the um, responsibility for the communication is with you. You're the non-expert. You take the notes, what you can understand and you take away, that's fine. My role is give you my knowledge. Your role is take what you are able to take. Okay? That's one way of doing things. Another way of doing things is this. If we have a, let's say, an equal status, your role is the listener, my role is the speaker, then the responsibility for the communication changes. That is, if I'm the speaker and you're the listener and it's not a hierarchical, then the responsibility for communication is mine. That is, if you don't understand, it's my fault. When we're talking about international, international presentations, it's the second one that counts. So, I'm going to explain very briefly, because we don't have much time, a simple cultural model, and then explain to you why the structure that we're going to apply is, is the one which is used for international presentations. So, here's a little bit of theory for you. So, how do you communicate effectively? What you're going to see here on the screen uh, is um, a, an idea which was created by someone called E.T. Hall. I'll put it up here. E.T. Hall. And Mr. Hall was an American anthropologist, and maybe I'll use red next time. Um, and he said, you can communicate in two ways. Uh, the first way you can communicate is by text. Text means words. What you say 
and what you write. Stop. Then another way of communicating is context. And context is everything which is not words. For example, pictures, yes. Yeah. Movements, gestures, expression, uh, clothing, but not only, yeah. Timing, the state of the relationship, hierarchy, the environment. All of those things also communicate things. And what Mr. Hall said was, or oh, sorry, Professor Hall, we are in a La Ricerca, is that no group only uses text or context, but a mix, and you don't realize you're using the mix. So let's take an example here. Culture A. Culture A sends information and receives information using this mix here. So most of the information is through words. That doesn't mean number of words, it means the importance given to the words, the weight given to the words in the message. So basically, if we take this extreme here, what I say is the message, full stop. That's all. So read the words, that's the message. There's nothing else there. If I go to the opposite extreme, the word is simply the tip of the iceberg. To understand the message, you have to read between the lines. Okay? And we've got two examples here, culture A and culture B. If we take culture A, most of the idea is through the word, a little bit on the layout. Let's imagine that culture A is working with culture B, two laboratories in different parts of the world. So I write an email, and then I click send. I don't realize, but my words have been used, uh, have been created using this uh, layout, this idea, this recipe here, this mix. Culture B receives in real time the email and opens the email. And culture B reads the email using this mixture. So I read the words and then I say, okay, now where's the real meaning? And I read between the lines. Yeah. Basically, they create a meaning that wasn't intended by culture A. Then they write a reply back. They write a reply using the same mix. So here are the words. If you really want to understand, you have to read between the lines. Send. Culture A receives and reads the words and said, OK, now I understand. In just two emails, you've created lots of misunderstandings. Yeah? We're going to use, um, we're going to use a, a presentation preparation scheme, which is here. Not because culture A is better than culture B, but because culture A basically has one important idea in mind when they communicate, clarity. So since we're going to use presenting to an international group, clarity is very important. Here, culture B is very much more concerned with relationship. So subtleties of reading between the lines. You can only read between the lines if you have a common knowledge of reading between the lines. But with an international audience, you don't have that. So if you need to present in Russia or in Brazil uh, or in Saudi Arabia, it's relatively easy. You read books on how to present in Saudi Arabia, how to present in Brazil. And then basically you have to translate your information using where you are on this continuum. But when you have an international audience like this one here, you can't do that because there are a number of different positions. So what we're going to use is an Anglo-Saxon way of doing things. Why? Because I'm Anglo-Saxon? No, because it's clear. Yeah? Unfortunately, it's also boring. Look, yeah? we're clear but boring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you a boring, solid, process-driven way of preparing the presentation. The color you have to put in. Okay? So I don't want you to become English, because that's not the idea. But to use an English structure, because it's very solid. And when you have a solid structure, you feel good. So when I come here, and I have a very solid structure, I can improvise, and I don't have the amygdala taking control. Okay? So, here we go. It's the idiot's guide to preparation. Okay? It's the five-step prep. Ready? Number one. Brainstorm ideas. 
So I sit, I'm, I'm at home or in the laboratory. I'm not in front of people. This is preparing. So I say, OK, so my idea is um, explaining, explaining presentations. OK, so international presentations. Uh, I've already spoken. I've already done the research on who you are, how many of you are you, your backgrounds, and so on. So I've done the market research, the presentation planner. And I just do this. OK, one, two, three, four, five. Eight, nine, all of these are ideas. I brainstorm. Bam, 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 bam. Second point. Cut 70% of the points. Ah, you're saying, wait, hang on. You go from 100% brainstorm down to three. How is that possible? And the Italians here will be saying, wait, can't we save time? Can't I just create 30% of the points? No, because you have two different processes here, the brain process for brainstorming and the brain process for analyzing, they're two different things. So we start with any idea will do, and then I'm going to bring down to three points, 30 percent of the points, the relevant points for this audience, not me. Remember you said time limits, you're right. We don't have time for all 10 points. Instead of wasting three strong points, four so-so points and three weak points, I don't have that time. You can put it in a report, and that's fine. But in this specific relationship between us, I've got to reduce time. So I'm going to use the three strongest points to get the idea over. I can create slides for medium and weak points and keep them in my back pocket for questions and answers. But for time between me and you, only the three most important. So it's a selection. It's a censorship, if you want. Yeah. Next one. I order the points. I give them a specific order. Remember, sorry. Remember what you said in your top 10 of what makes it important for you? Logic, a logical sequence. I'll give you some examples of the sequence. But if there's no logic, we get lost. And you as a listener, you don't like that. Subdivide, here we get very Anglo-Saxon. Subdivide each point. So I take each point and I subdivide it. And it's, uh, I go to intro, then I develop, and then I close. So each point, gets subdivided into three little pieces, OK? And then finally. And this is sort of a very Anglo-Saxon process. I check the links between the points. So I make sure that I have that flow. That's it. It's very, very process-driven. It's very solid. But it gives me a base to be able to make cuts and changes in real time. OK? Any questions on the five-step idiot's guide? You're saying, wow, this takes a lot of time. When people say to me, usually, I have a presentation, I open up PowerPoint. No. <laughs> PowerPoint is the last thing you open up. The first thing you do is, what's the audience? And then we start on this idea of the preparation guide. Now, maybe you need some more ideas on this, so I'll give you some more ideas on this. How about format? Well, there are various ways. So various orders you can put. One is chronological. Usually the classic one is past, present, future. But it doesn't have to be. Depending upon your idea and your audience, you can change things around. Geographical. So uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, South America. Or area one, two, three. Comparison or contrast, how they do things here, how we do things there. A classic, oh, I've made a mistake there, sorry, I'm human. <laughs> a classic idea of a consulting, which is, this is your problem, Here's, here is our solution. Okay, so sorry about that. I will change it for the PDF that I send you. So here's your problem, here's our solution. An acronym. Do you know what an acronym is? So you use the first letters of the words, put them together, and they make something that is rememberable. Uh, for example, 
In English, in giving information, not relationship, but information, you use something which is called KISS. So keep it short and simple. Not stupid, but keep it short and simple. Yeah? Which is linked to what we've just seen here. So it's high text. So keep it short and simple. Simple words, simple structure. Yeah? Now, if I explain English information flow as high text, low context, that's jargon. But if I get you to remember KISS, then you remember it. Okay, so that's the acronym. Analogy or metaphor. In most parts of the world, people tell stories. And they tell stories to get very, very complicated information through to people who are not experts. Yeah? In many parts of the world, they don't do that. Everything is on logic. The scientific world... Many parts of, uh, let's say, the northern world, they don't use this anymore. But it's a very, very strong uh, possibility that can be used in many parts of the world, which are used every day. Finally, the one that I see most of all, the shopping list. Never use the shopping list. You know when you go shopping, it's just brainstorming. You're going to where, wherever you go, Despar, Pam, whatever. And the shopping list is toothpaste, wine, toilet paper, meat, peas, just the first thing that comes into your mind. Most people's presentations are like a shopping list. There's no logic to it. It's just the first thing that came into mind. But remember, you said you don't like that. So if we know that you don't like that, we don't use the list. So use an order that puts all of the pieces together. It makes it much easier for people to follow. Because we're under ideas and stress of time, this idea is, ah, I've, only got, I've only got 13 minutes, so I'm going to push, 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 which I'm going to do anyway. But if I push data, then instead of you taking more information, you'll take less information. So it's very important. You said data heavy. What can we do with data to make it more acceptable, to make it more digestible for people? First one, don't give them everything. Do they need everything? If they need everything, I've got a report they can read later in their own time. I only give them the things necessary for the main message I want them to go away with. Okay? So I select. If it's possible, I group it in groups of three. Um, why? Well, because bra the brain tends to do that. So we do the, uh, where have I got, I've got it. Italians, who are our Italians? Put your hands up, okay, right, without thinking, without thinking, in Italian, your cell phone number, in cellulare, bye. Okay, even if you didn't hear that over there, she's just, she's, she's just linking it in little clusters, clusters of two or three. You don't remember a long chain of information one at a time. We just don't do that. Because our memories are used to playing around with little clusters of two or three, do the same for them with giving, you, giving data. So give them data in little clusters. It's something that makes it easier for them to remember. Uh, alliteration. Alliteration is using the first sound of words, using a similar sound. I'll give you an example. Preparing data. Select, simplify, sequence. That's three examples of alliteration. Okay? Again, alliteration, just like clustering, helps people remember. So, since the brain naturally remembers in a certain way, if I can channel the information in a similar way, I help you. So you're happy. Simplify. If you have a number which is central to your message, don't just say it once. Because human beings, their motivation goes like this, the energy goes like this. Let's just imagine that just for five seconds, this gentleman's motivation goes down. And I've, the key number he must remember, that's a shame. He's missed it. So I need to say it more than once. Make the number meaningful. In other words, make it meaningful in their language. Remember Frank, the management consultant? At the end, he needs to say... Thanks to me, Mattel toys increased their turnover by 1%. Yeah, but five-year-old children don't understand that. So he said, um, thanks to me, 
the man was able to make an increase in Barbies, which was the same as one Barbie for every little girl or boy in Canada. Now, that means a lot of Barbies. Okay, so you're taking something and you're transferring it into a language that makes value for them. Your politicians do it all of the time. The politicians will say, I don't know, uh, the, the amount of money that is being used on this project would be enough to buy you uh, Sky TV services for the next five years for the whole of Milan. Yeah, they're just taking information and putting it into a language that you understand. And finally, guys, sequencing. So you have data. Start with the data that they already know, and then go to the new stuff. Start with the data which is safe data in terms of the relationship, and then go to the delicate stuff. Why? Because a presentation is a relationship between us. So in order to build trust, I start with things which cement the trust. OK, we're fine. We agree and then I move to the new stuff. So data is choosing what is relevant for the main message. Don't throw data at them because they will turn off immediately. Process, well, you can do it in different ways. The first way is a very sort of northern way of doing things, which is we begin at word one and we end at word 550. Another one is multitasking. We'll do a little bit here, a little bit there. But whatever you do in preparing the process, what's important is, in a perfect world, the structure is simple, and you have something called fermentation time. Don't finish the presentation two seconds before you give the presentation, because it's not ready yet. Yeah? It's just not ready. It's like cooking something in the oven at a very high temperature, and then immediately asking someone to eat it. They burn their mouth. You need things to cool down. A perfect way would be at least 24 hours. I know I'm speaking about the perfect world, I know. At least 24 hours of cooling off. Why? Because if you sleep on it, then your brain subconsciously will be saying, mm, mm, mm. and then the morning afterwards, you'll say, wait, I'm going to move that slide. I'm going to change that. And you say, oh, that's ridiculous. It works. So if you have a chance, give it a cooling off period, guys, because otherwise you create some problems for yourself. OK, so process easy. Five simple steps. The more you apply the steps, the stronger the structure is. If you have a strong structure, you feel good in terms of your amygdala. OK? Oopla, come back. How about words? Hmm, words. Because remember, when we come here, we're usually worried about what to say. Well, I already told you that really, um, <laughs> these are the structural words, the process words, so they're the easy ones. The most difficult thing is, how can I translate it into concepts which are useful for, for people? At a certain point, at this point here, when you've identified what are the, the main uh, topics, you're going to have to go back here and say, wait, there are key words that everyone in the room must understand. So I need to identify what are those key words, and then I need to work on how to get those key words clear to people. Uh, I'll give you an example. So let's take this away. Let's imagine that in my presentation, I have these keywords. Usually we're talking about three, four keywords for each point. I have presentation. I have communication. And I have L1 int. OK, right. Let's just imagine these three. So what do I do? I'm still preparing. Huh? This is still the preparation phase. I have three columns, and the three columns are general, semi-technical, and technical. What do these mean? Really simple. 
General means if I use a keyword, you will understand the word, you will recognize the word, and you'll understand what it means in this context. In other words, I don't need to worry. You know it. Uh, let's take an example. If I want you to understand presentation, meaning a communication from one to a group, I think you probably understand that. So you recognize the word, you understand the meaning, fine. So it goes here for general. Good news. I don't have to worry about that. Okay. Communication. Well, you recognize the word communication, but if for me communication is the reaction to an external stimulus, maybe that doesn't come automatically to you. So I need to work a little bit on the definition. So it becomes semi-technical. Finally, jargon, L1 int, first language interference. That is, when I'm speaking in a second language, my first language has an impact on my effectiveness. So that's jargon. So you haven't seen that before. You don't know what it is. It becomes a technical word. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the key words and I'm filtering them according to their needs, not my needs. So let's go back to what you were saying. I'm making the difficult easy. I'm making the difficult easy. So by doing that, I can start to play around and say, now how can I explain these words? These words I don't have to worry about general. They're understood. Here I need to work a little bit. Here I need to work a lot. So what can I do? We have something which is called, oh, sorry, that's Obama. Um, keyword development. This is keyword development. I take a word which is here or here, semi-technical or technical, and I have some problems, and I put it in the middle here. And then I have a look at a number of ways of explaining it. A definition, so defining that concept. An example, a synonym, a similar word, an antonym or an opposite word, a metaphor, and we don't have time to explain this, but alternative sensory channels, your sensors, uh, you have a, what can I say, a preference putting information in and taking it out from your brain according to your sensors. Some people like visual more than some people like auditory and so on. So it's finding the right link. We can forget about this on this one here. Basically, you're going to work, and you're saying, this is going to take a long time. Yes, you will work on how can I look for different ways of explaining the same concept, technical, semi-technical, and this will give me options. So when I am speaking to you, and I try concept one for definition, and I see people don't understand, I can try another thing. If you're speaking in a language which is not your own, the problem is you don't have the linguistic capability in your own language. You've got this. So what do I say? No problem. You've got all the options here. If you've done the work, if you've done the work. If you haven't done the work, hey, you're in trouble. Yeah, that's when the amygdala has uh, control. Now you're saying, how about an example? OK, I'll give you an example. You, you want an example, I'll give you an example. It's not that far away from lunchtime, so how about digestible? Hmm? Digestible meaning, in this case, it hits a semi-technical. You've recognized the word digestible. It's digestible in terms of accepting information in an international presentation, okay? So, here's a definition. Information which can be understood and retained by the audience, okay? Most people use only definitions and stop. But that doesn't mean that everyone likes definitions. There are other ways of doing it. Examples. Do you remember the last time someone came here, took a very, very complicated topic and made it look easy? Do you remember the last time that someone you were sitting there? That's an example of digestible. OK? So someone said, you've got a, a someone super, super communicator, takes very complicated idea, makes it look easy. That's digestible. Synonym, comprehensible, calibrated. Opposites, heavy, indigestible. Ah, here come my favorites. I've got two for you today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask you first, do I have anyone who likes chocolate cake? Anyone like chocolate cake? 
Oh, lots of chocolate cake eaters. Okay. Right, lady over there. And also, sorry, who are the chocolate eating? Okay, okay. okay. This, gender, this lady here. Okay, fine, fine. So what I'm going to do is this. I'd like you to imagine I've got the most amazing sack of torta here. Yeah, it's fantastic. Mmm, smells good. Okay. Now, I know it's just before lunch, but I won't tell anyone. Would you like a slice of this cake? Just a little one? Yeah? Okay. Right, a little slice of your cake. Okay. Now, you want to taste it? You tell me what it's like. Taste it. Yeah, well, well, hang on. I haven't given you the fork first. There you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you want to taste it? Is it good? Yes. Yeah, it's very good, isn't it? Huh? It's, mm, 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 it's good. Can I give you another tiny slice? You can eat it later. Yeah, yeah, you can eat it later. There you go. Okay. Yeah, and she likes that. She likes, she's this good, 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 good. Now, your colleague over there, she says, that's not fair. I, I, I like sakatot as well. I like chocolate cake. No problem. I have another chocolate cake, which is just as mm, yummy and wonderful and just like exactly, you like chocolate cake as well, right? Okay, okay, so can you, can you open your mouth, please? Can you open your mouth? <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, I just deafened your <laughs> IT person. Basically, instead of something pleasurable, bit by bit, piece by piece, suddenly it becomes a torture. She can't breathe because there's chocolate cake in her mouth, yeah? So the idea is, if I give you information which is easy to digest one at a time, it's easy to take on, it's pleasurable. If I give you too much stuff, data heavy, in one go, instead of you digesting, you block, you resist. Okay? That's one metaphor. Here's my favorite metaphor of the day. Ready? So this, this is information. Okay? Who wants to play the game with me? This gentleman here. You ready to play the game? Right, are you good at catching? So, so. You're going to have to put your, your iPhone there, yeah? Because you're going to have to use both hands. Ready? So you're going to catch. So this is information. Ready? Excellent. Okay, hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> Two pieces of information. Ready? Excellent. Okay, right. Hang on. I've got uh, three, three pieces of information. Three. Okay, ready? Okay, right. Okay, ready? All the information now. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for being so sporting. So, <laughs> again, the idea is this. Look, if I machine gun you with information, I'm saving time, maybe, but you're not being effective. So the idea of cake against slices and paper kick clutching are two simple metaphors of digesting information. Sorry. <laughs> you get to keep that, though. You can take it back to the lab and use it there. So, as you can see, there are a number of ways of getting the same concept across, really simply, okay? Um, I'm going to ask you, just having a look at what you can see around here, so I'll leave this apart. Definition, example, synonym, opposite, metaphor. I'd like you to choose one, just one, that you think is the most useful one for you to understand digestible in terms of understanding information in an international presentation. So you just choose one of those, yeah, have a look, and then I'm going to ask you to vote for it, okay? Chosen? Okay. No? Still thinking? Okay, I'll just go through and I'll just ask you to put your hand up if you've chosen that one, All right? Definitions? No definitions. Interesting. Most scientific presentations stop at definitions. Examples? Oh, lots of examples. Okay, thank you. Synonym? Got a couple of synonyms. Great. Opposite? We don't like opposites today. Okay. Metaphors? Oh, lots of metaphors as well. Now, this was just one example. But can you see the potential for you to give you options with this? Because if you spend time on keyword development, you've got options in front of you. You've planned where the information is going. And if you see that using your keyword doesn't give you the return that you want on a definition, you've already planned plan B, another idea. So you become much more effective. And you feel relaxed. You've got things under control. OK, we've run out of time, and I knew we would do. Um, the idea of being together today was to give you the basic ideas of how can you prepare the background for presentation. 
Most of the things that you gave me here were worries about delivering a presentation. Yeah? The problem is that if you haven't prepared well, then your delivery is going to go badly. <laughs> yeah? Your high-risk delivery. Um, what I'm going to do is this. I also, I've already spoke to Suzanne. My idea would be, and then we can speak about the possibility, is, look, I'll send you this stuff. Um, I'm going to ask you to think about applying this stuff, trying to apply it to your reality. I know that June, yes. that in June, there are going to be lots of presentations. So I thought it might be useful that uh, there's a symposium, little thing like that, tiny little thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I thought it might be useful if you apply these to something, to a presentation you must give, then the next time what we can do is we can spend all of our time in a sort of a workshop idea where you deliver it and we speak about delivery. So you are applying this stuff to the presentation and so the next bit is today was preparation, the next one is delivery, if you think that's a good idea. Yeah? If you think it's a good idea. Because it makes no sense for me to give you feedback on delivery if you don't know how to prepare. I'm going to send you not only the slides here, but I'm also going to send you something which I think is very, very useful, which is something called, let me just come out of here, which is something called Say It With Charts. Um, I know that you have to spend a lot of time on data, and there's a very, very interesting PDF that I can send you, which explains how to use graphs and tables correctly. Yeah? And basically, the idea is, again, you need to guide people through. Don't throw information at them. You guide them through. Because otherwise, they will give up. I'll give you an example. I know we're going over time, but we're flexible Italians. Go away. Come on, go away. Here's a graph. What message does this graph give you? Bam. First message that you see. Sorry? Product C is always higher. Same. Any other ideas, different ideas? Green is growing. Green is decreasing. Okay. Should, should, I, should I tell you what the person who created this graph wanted as, as the main message? 2004 was a difficult year. I'm sorry, but that's rubbish. <laughs> that's terrible. Now, before you laugh too much, you go and have a look at your data. You have a look at the graphs that you're using right now, right now, and I'm sure that if you ask someone who hasn't been there, they won't be able to tell you what the main point is. So what we're going to do is I'm also going to send you a PDF of this, saying with charts. It's not my idea, but it's a very good idea. For example, did you realize that bar charts accentuate and tables minimize? If you want to create something and make it look stronger, use a bar chart. Because visually, it has a much greater impact. So if your idea for your main message is increase the difference, use a bar chart. If you want to bring everything down, then use a table. Because if you use a table, numbers visually more or less have the same impact. How about trying to impress on someone the importance by using playing around with the y-axis? Because basically, if this is exactly the same data, but I make the y-axis much smaller from 30% to 42, then the trend is much more obvious. Little things, tiny things that allow you to influence towards the main message. So if you like, I can also send you this PDF of saying it with charts. OK, right. We're going to finish off like this. Uh, I'm going to give you, mm, yes, why not? I'll give you this. I know that you, I'll take this away. I know that you're concerned about these things here. So we'll go through very quickly what you did. And then I'll give you this, which is called the S list, which you can do in your copious free time. Okay? First, emotions. Very simply, guys, if you want to deal with emotions, which is a natural part, then we need to understand the difference between the relationship of presenter to presentation and listener to presentation. The more you spend your time on understanding the audience and on preparing well for that audience, the more you'll feel comfortable. You'll feel in control. 
Okay? All of the pieces we looked at today were designed to creating this solid preparation. Be clear. Absolutely. The idea is the clearer the structure is, the easier it is for me to get the message across. So it has to be clear and of perceived value. Time limits. You're absolutely right. It seems crazy, but at the beginning, you need to spend a minute and a minute and a half on the relationship. If you do that, then you're going to be using your time effectively because they'll listen to your message. If you go too quickly, they won't listen to your message. They'll just cut off. Interact, so presenter, <laughs> present and audience. Next time we'll definitely look at that. But basically, if you're able to target the audience with a message that makes sense to them, they'll listen. Yeah? Oh, very important. Everything, I'll already tell you for next time, everything goes through the audience. So I spend as little time as possible reading slides and as much time as possible interacting with you for visually. Um, final thing, making difficult easy, absolutely. But I can't do that in real time. I have to do that before in the preparation. Uh, the S list, guys, is all about delivering. Uh, it's a list of different elements and basically, you have to go through the elements. Let me show you. You have to go through the elements. Oh, I'll show you how to play around with this next time as well. Yeah? Oopla, not like that. OK, right. So there are a number of elements that begin with S, apart from one where I've cheated, and there's an E beginning, and an explicit, but I put an S there anyway. Yeah, it's artistic license. So go through the different key points. And when you read them, you can, if you're happy with them, if you say, oh, yeah, OK, I can do that, then you can just tick them off. So talk, so for example, speak to them. Talk to your audience. You're not on TV. Say something, an idea to each person before moving on to another. If you think you do that normally, boom, put a cross. No problem. At the end, you will have a number of empty boxes. Go back to the empty boxes and prioritize. So which of these is the most important one for you now? Now. Number one. Two, three, four, da, da, da. What you create is a little mini action plan. So what you do is, with your colleagues, you say, look, number one for me is no shopping list. No and, 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 and. So the next time I do a presentation, I want you to give me feedback only on shopping lists. And I'm going to continue to work on that until it's no longer a problem. So you only work on one thing. When it's no longer a problem, ba -ba -ba, cross off, go to the next one. OK? So very simply, a simple idea of what to work on for delivery. OK, final wrap up. So today, the idea was, Biggest problem for us, biggest problem is not what to say. It's easy to know what to say. It's how can we channel the adrenaline into something positive. Take the lights and put it on the audience. See you next time. And next time, we do the real thing, which is delivery. So I'll be sitting where you're sitting, and you'll be standing where I'm standing. OK, thank you. Bye-bye.